Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Draves, and I'm here to introduce and welcome George Anders, who is joining us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. George is here today to discuss his book, The Rare Find, Spotting Exceptional Talent Before Everyone Else. He has been visiting everyone from soldiers to surgeons, learning about how great American organizations pick talent. Anyone at Microsoft who has been an, been an interviewer knows that distinguishing between a good interviewee and a great hire can be challenging. The good news is that this ability can be honed. George Anders is one of the founding writers at Bloomberg View, and while at the Wall Street Journal, he won a Pulitzer in 1997. He is also the author of Merchants of Debt, Health Against Wealth, and Perfect Enough. He's been using Microsoft products since the days of DOS. Please join me in welcoming him to Microsoft. Thanks very much. That's nice. Thanks very much for coming, and thanks for giving me the chance to visit Microsoft. Um, I used to come up here in 1993. My wife was very briefly part of a research project that Nathan Mirvold was leading, and um, I think anyone who you know, spent a few months in the company of Nathan, at the very least, has a whole lot of stories to tell, and we've got a few. But what I wanted to do today was to tell you a little bit about how I came to write this book, um, what I learned in the course of research, and then some things that might be applicable to the Microsoft community. Uh, this is a book that probably got started a dozen years ago. Uh, I was writing for the Wall Street Journal then. I was covering uh, the dot-com economy and venture capital. And I'd wanted to embed myself inside a venture firm to see how in the world they picked a deal. Amazon had gone public at the time. Uh, it was a fabulous success. It was at that time incurring big losses but had a gigantic stock market value. So you had easily a dozen, two dozen firms on Sand Hill Road going, how do we find the next Amazon? And I got one to take me inside as they heard their auditions. And they let me listen to a half dozen different pitches. And the one that I quickly glommed onto was uh, something that was called living.com. And it was going to sell furniture online. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, um, furniture is probably a uniquely bad product to sell online. The shipment is difficult, uh, you want to sit on the sofa, uh, return policy is very problematic, and there isn't a standard SKU. When you buy a song, when you buy a book, when you buy a lot of other things, that is exactly what you're buying. Furniture is always customized, and the delivery times are huge. So we can go on and on about why the idea wasn't going to work. But this was 1998, and everyone was very excited. And they had, the firm had decided that it was essential to find someone who was willing to bet big. And that meant that all of the entrepreneurs who came in and said, I'm probably going to lose 3 or $4 million on this, and then I'll turn it around and get it profitable, those were sent packing right away. That was not a big idea. They wanted to hear from someone who was confident that they could lose $40 million before, hopefully, turning it back around. And the one thing you knew for sure about Living.com, everything else was chancy, but you did know that it could definitely lose $40 million on the way down. So uh, being an embedded reporter on this, I got to watch a lot of the partners' meetings where they didn't just hear from the entrepreneur, but they closed the doors and then said, what are we going to do about this? And there was this incredible tug of war between the partners who were sponsoring it, who felt that this was their chance to have the next Bezos and the guy championing it was the right guy to, to invest in, and then the house skeptic who felt that this was just a ticket to Chapter 11 and it ought to be someone else's. And they went back and forth and you know, kept doing more due diligence and kept getting more stressed. And the takeaway point for me was sometimes you don't know. Sometimes it's very hard to pin down who's going to be successful, who isn't. And we've got a whole set of areas that we can approach very clinically and analytically. I mean, if you're applying for a mortgage, it's pretty straightforward whether you're, you deserve a mortgage or not. We all understand the system. If you're applying to start a company, that's much more treacherous. And as I got to know other industries and other fields, I felt there's a commonality here. There are an awful lot of bright people looking to find the game-changing people who will change the future. Uh, and yet, no one has a fully standardized set of rules. And what I'd like to do for two or three years is go travel to every place that I think is instructive and see what I can learn. So that's what led to the book. And let me take a moment to frame it uh, a little more broadly, and then we'll start getting into some specific stories. 
So the starting point, of course, is everyone wants top flight talent. Uh, and you know, in the engineering world, you talk about 10x software engineers, or in Mark Zuckerberg's case, 100x engineers. Uh, you know, the war for talent is a theme you'll hear from management consultants. But uh, are we doing any good at finding that? And the answer is it's erratic at best. Uh, there's a survey by New Talent Management Network where they ask 2,000 HR managers, are you winning the war for talent? Uh, only 18% said, yes, we are. Um, the majority of them said, you know, we're fighting it to a draw. The war continues. And fully one in 10 said, no, we're losing. We're actually, you know, doing a poorer job of finding talent than we were a while ago. And I appreciate their candor. These are not easy answers to give. Everyone knows what you want to be in the green bar. You don't want to be in the yellow or the red. But a lot of organizations are in the yellow or the red. Uh, what's even more striking, when you ask people, how are you doing on your external hires? Uh, the answer is there's only about 47, 48% acceptance with results. You ask them how they're doing on the internal promotions. They've gotten to know these people better. There should be a deeper sense of who you want. Scores there are even worse. So we, we don't know how to hire strangers, and we're stumbling around even more in how to promote the people we already know. Uh, I had enough time on this to go and read what's in the academic literature. And what struck me is, you know, in classic economist fashion, We've gone and studied the problem that's most easy to quantify, where the data is the richest, and the answers are the most shallow and barren. So we know how to hire bank tellers. It's very systematized. We know how to hire uh, low-end healthcare workers, uh, lab technicians, the like. We know uh, nurses. We know how to hire auto workers. Uh, but do we know how to hire the, the people and how to pick the people that are really going to drive growth in our organization? And the answer is that's much less systematized. The sample sizes are smaller. The variables are much larger. There's a constant redefinition of the problem that what was a great hire in 2004 may not be the person you want in 2008 or 2011. So we've got an area here where there's much less guidance. Uh, and what I wanted to do was answer two key questions in doing the book. First is, how do world-class, ambitious organizations get talent right? And the second is, what can the rest of us learn from them? Uh, on a project like this, I felt lateral thinking was going to be important. We all know our own industry well. We know our own company extremely well. But there are always other fields where you go, I wonder what we could learn from them. I mean, the success of Moneyball, which is a very popular book about how the Oakland A's pick baseball talent. I and mean, that's been <clears throat> a bestseller on and off for eight years. It's a very popular movie. And we go not because we really care about how the Oakland A's did in 2001, but because we think somewhere there's something inside the game of baseball that could apply to our world. So I wanted to look for um, you know, easily 15 different money ball type situations across the, the US economy. And I got one batch from um, sports, performing arts, the like, where data is rich, where the definition of success is clear. Um, I got another batch from public service professions, um, healthcare, medicine, law. Um, and then I got a third batch from business. I want to start with some stories of uh, going to see how Army Special Forces picks their soldiers. And this, of course, is the elite end of the Army. These are the eight or 16 person groups that will go into valleys in Afghanistan uh, that will stand on the border between Burma and Thailand and try and stop the drug trade. They're trying to do with a small number of soldiers what you can't do with 1,000 or 10,000. And you know, if you look at the impact of Special Forces, these are the guys who got bin Laden. And that was something that we never were able to do with a big unit. We were able to do with a very small number of Navy SEALs. So the commitment to excellence to unique <coughs> skills is there. And I called up our, all three um, branches, and the Army said, come on in. Uh, you ready to see everything we do? And I said, sure. It's one of these questions you answer without really knowing where it's going to take you. So where it took me was the swampy pine lands of North Carolina at 2 in the morning. And the answer is, if the soldiers are there, I need to be there too. So I basically had very little sleep for two weeks. But I got to see how they do selection. And here's a place I want to start. Uh, it's a dim picture for a reason. This is shot around 4.30 in the morning. And what you've got in the center is a busted up Vietnam era trailer with one wheel missing. It weighs about half a ton. It's rusted as can be. Uh, its mechanics have pretty much broken down. And they're going to ask small teams of soldiers to push that thing th three miles through the sand. And they're going to give them a handful of things to make the job easier if they can figure out what to do with them. They're going to get uh, four long metal poles. Uh, they're going to get uh, a bunch of lashings. And they're going to get 100 feet of rope. And they're going to have five minutes to figure out what to do with it. 
Now, what they don't tell the teams of soldiers is there is no perfect solution. But if you're resourceful, you can figure out ways to use those tools to create some sort of balance, counterbalance, that will make it easier for the, the trailer to hold upright. Uh, but you've got an engineering problem to solve in a hurry, and then you've got a team organization problem to solve over three hours of how do you use all the soldiers on your team to get it going forward. Uh, the key point in the field, you have to improvise. So what we've got here is a handful of soldiers trying to build a, uh, an arrangement for this. They're not firing bullets. They're not shooting down the enemy. What they are doing is trying to solve an unexpected problem that may not have a great solution. And you know what? To be a good soldier, you're always doing that. That is really what the missions that define you. Uh, now, since I assume we have uh, an audience today, people with a, a, an engineering or technical background to some degree, you'll like this. Um, when you've got two beams uh, and you put them on top of each other, what's going to happen with the top beam in terms of your ability to align it to the corners? You've got some three-dimensionality there. So the guy has drawn out a sketch that assumes that you can form the X and all four points will touch the base equally. Doesn't quite work that way. These are strong young men, so they completely bent the top beam on the X so that it sagged and did touch the two points, but they then had a very unwieldy, rickety structure. Uh, and they never figured out what to do with the rope. There is a solution for it, but uh, some guys with uh, uniforms are going to come after me if I reveal it. So let's just assume that the rope has a role. And then they headed out for uh, their three-mile push through the sand. And this is where you really see you know, who's going to make it as a soldier. Uh, this is a job all about adversity and ambiguity. If you look closely, the front group of soldiers here, uh, they pretty much know what they're doing. Everyone's pushing. Everyone's got a presence. You look at the back group there, there's one guy who has absolutely no defined role. He, they just couldn't fit him in. There's another guy who's falling off the contraption. And <clears throat> it's hard enough work. You need all eight people working. If you've only got four or five working and the others are spectators, you're going to wear down the people who are working and you're going to create incredible tensions between those who work and those who don't. I got to see two weeks of exercises like this, and they were remarkably good at sorting out people who could work their way through difficulty and people who couldn't. So if you ask, what's this all about? It's a hunt for tenacity. That's going to be the trait that these soldiers need, and that's what's going to make them effective when they go out into these unexpected postings where they won't be able to be provisioned with those uh, nice, tasty military rations. If they're going to eat, they need to find the villager with the goat and figure out some way to buy the goat, charm the goat out of him, commandeer the goat, and still keep the loyalty of the village. Uh, in, in the, the stories I'd hear from them of their deployments were you know, one test of cleverness after another. You end up in an area with the Taliban, where can you put your camp? Best place to put it is in the cemetery because no one's going to rain down bullets on their ancestors. And that way you're safe even against a hostile, audience, uh, hostile um, settlement. So uh, I, I came away from that going, this is an interesting example. They're looking for our intangible virtues of character and they've got a very systematic way of defining them. Uh, let me go to a couple other areas that I found were instructive. Um, I got interested in how Teach for America works. Um, can I ask how many people here either consider Teach for America or have friends who've done it or siblings? Okay, so we've got some awareness. Just to, to share with the rest of the group, this was started in Princeton in the late 1980s. It was meant to be a program where uh, students graduating from top liberal arts schools could go and do two years of community service, almost a domestic Peace Corps where you'd go and teach in some of America's most difficult schools. And in the beginning, Teach for America assumed that what you wanted were charismatic, wonderful, gushy communicators, and their showcase test question was, what is wind? And you were expected to give an answer, you know, wind is the fluttering of the angel's wings, you know, wind is, you know, molecules moving through air, uh, something that, was, that showed that you could communicate something exciting. Uh, that's great for a dorm room. That's probably great for a senior seminar or a freshman seminar. Where are these students going? They're not going to Lakeside. They're not going to an audience of people who want to hear that high level. They, uh, they've got uh, classrooms that are struggling to keep order. They're going to go into places where there's no heat in the winter. They're going to go into places where there are 36 kids and 28 desks. And you've got to figure out what to do with the kids who don't even have somewhere to sit. And what's the trait you really need for that? You need someone with resilience, perseverance, someone who can work through difficulty. And Teach for America, to their credit, has retooled their selection system so now what they're looking for are those students who can uh, turn into the teachers who can thrive there. When they look at grade points, they're not looking for the people who had 3.8s or 3.9s all the way across, although there's nothing wrong with that. What they really want are the people who started out perhaps from an underprivileged background themselves 
and had to fight to get B's their freshman year, and then year by year took their grade point up. Uh, they're looking for people not so much who are uh, heads of the successful organizations on campus, but the ones who managed to take the smaller sports teams, the less well-funded student groups, and make a go of those. Their key trait, perseverance, and you know, if you look at Teach for America's uh, marketing and imaging now, it's can you get kids to read in an environment where you know, spray painting and run-down parking lots are common. Uh, so again, looking for an intangible trait and building up a selection system that will spot that. Uh, I watched some of their sample lessons that they were having candidates teach. And in the course of each of them, they would have one of the Teach for America people start waving their hand like a kid in the classroom. And they would ask what was a totally off-track question, uh, representing what's now politely called the off-task student. When I went through school, they were called troublemakers, and they were sent to the dean. But we have new vocabulary now. These are off-task students. And uh, what a differentiator. And you could see the people who could gradually bring that kid back into the discussion, acknowledge their answer, and show them what they needed to do to get with the group. And then the people who were either peremptory and rude to that kid, or who were so eager to please the kid who was ultimately off on their own planet that the entire lesson just ground to a halt. So they look for perseverance. They find perseverance. Let me give you one more example from far outside the world we work in, and then I'm going to start bringing the conversation home closer to what we do. So another area I wanted to go see is how do you identify a great athlete? Uh, and I figured the most interesting juncture was when high school basketball players who are you know, competing in whatever their school is start to come into the great American sports machine, which is Division I college sports. And the good people at Nike have helped facilitate this process with a bunch of summer basketball tournaments. They're all in out-of-the-way places. I went to one in um, North Augusta, South Carolina, right? Um, in a gym with maybe 50 to 100 people there and the best basketball players as a cohort that I've seen. I mean, you know, these are guys who are already, you know, stars of Division I teams. In a couple years, they'll be in the NBA. Uh, if you follow college basketball, uh, Jared Sullinger now at Ohio State, uh, Austin Rivers now at Duke. But at this, at this stage, they're relatively unknown high school juniors or seniors and they're just playing for the fun of it and a chance to get noticed. So who are all these people sitting on the sideline? Uh, these are the coaches of all the top Division I schools, and they come here because they're going to see the best players uh, they can. A couple points that made a big impression to me, um, chatting with the coaches and the professional scouts. I mean, there are 100 players playing there. All of them will end up in Division I. Most of them will end up with scholarships. But the insight that was shared with me is if you're looking for more than 15 players here, if you're paying attention to more than 15, you don't really understand your own program. You need to know, are we a school that's built around tight defense? Find the best defenders. Are we a school that's built around superb outside shooters? Find the best shooters. If you're jumping from area to area, you don't know what you're looking for. You're not going to build a cohesive team. The second thing that really struck me is how much attention the scouts paid to the little stuff. Uh, I sat and watched a game with one of them, and he was doing his uh, markups. And he was seeing an entirely different game than me. I was paying attention to who was scoring, who was dunking, who was blocking shots. He was looking at all the little stuff. Timeouts are fascinating to these scouts. Why? Because that's when you see which players run into the huddle, which ones listen to the coach, which ones give their teammates a pat on the back, and which ones couldn't care less. Um, how players handle injuries. I mean, there was one player who came in there, superb um, physical achievements. He twisted his ankle at some point, spent the rest of the game sitting on the floor, looking away, and just basically feeling sorry for himself. I'd feel bad if I twisted my ankle too, but there was a, an indicator there that said, you know, this is not someone who's there for the team. This is someone who's there for themselves. And the coaches would tell me, you know, we can teach people to be better shooters. We can teach them a lot of physical skills. We cannot change their personality. And every time, you know, one of the top coaches said, every time I've taken a player who was a difficult attitude case, but I was told, oh, they're just having a bad day or they're kind of quiet, I'd regret it for the next four years. So, and to, to bring it down to a nutshell, uh, when I'm watching the three-point shots, I'm watching something that ultimately doesn't matter that much in scouting. Uh, if I'm watching the pushing and elbowing underneath to get in position for a rebound, that's where I'm seeing what does matter. So I watched uh, all Ohio Red play a game. Their star guard scored 25 points. Uh, one of their uh, less noticed players had you know, five or six points and a couple steals. And then their big guy in the middle, Jared Sollinger, had you know, a dozen rebounds or so. And I said, OK, so what did we see? And Bob Gibbons, the scout I was watching with, said Solinger's the best player in high school these days. 
Uh, that outside shooter is too erratic and too selfish. He's probably not going to make it in Division I. And that guy you hardly noticed, uh, he's got terrific hustle and he's going to do just fine. And son of a gun, the guy turned out to be right on all the points. I mean, he's seeing a game that I'm not seeing. Takeaway point there, in sports, the small stuff is huge. So diligence and good habits are the elements that lead to success. Uh, I mean, you need to have some level of physical talent, but character matters, attitude matters, uh, dedication matters. And this is a world where you know, the, the yardsticks between success and failure are so pronounced. I mean, if your team wins, you get contract extensions, you be, you're the hero of the campus. If your team loses, you're fired and they're looking for another coach. So there's a, a clarity to thinking about talent and performance that sometimes you don't see in a big corporate setting where it's easier to dodge your mistakes or transfer them to someone else or um, shuffle accountability around. You can't do that in sports. Uh, so the takeaway from there was, uh, again, uh, the importance of the, the hidden virtues, the small things that can speak a lot to character, and the importance of extended auditions where you're watching people perform over time rather than trying to learn everything in a short interview. Uh, and sum it up, uh, the most interesting characters may have what I call jagged resumes. There's a whole um, section in the early part of the book that talks about the importance of evaluating people with jagged resumes. When I say that, I mean people who've got some remarkable standout skills, but also some apparent flaws, and knowing how to evaluate those and to move the best ones out of the maybe pile into the pile of people who are every bit as impressive as the ones that seem to have perfect resumes is a hallmark of whether it's you know, Goldman Sachs, Johns Hopkins Medicine, uh, an awful lot of organizations that just pull ahead of the competition. Uh, so let me take a moment to talk a little bit about decoding the jagged resume. Uh, I should point out, you know, Microsoft's founder, Bill Gates, didn't finish Harvard. And I'm, I'm going over what's you know, familiar American lore, but it's a reminder for all the places that say we only hire college graduates. You're going to miss some of the most extraordinary people out there who didn't finish college because it wasn't challenging enough as opposed to it was too hard. So what distinguishes the best of jagged resumes? They excel on resilience, efficiency, self-reliance, desire to improve, curiosity and creativity. And then I'd add in management and ability to influence others without having full control. And you know, the, these are five traits with a high level of abstraction. Each organization has a very high level of specificity. What will make you succeed at one place will be different than what makes you succeed at the other. But uh, there's always one or two of those traits that surfaces as this is what's most essential. This is what we use to find our winners. What doesn't matter? Uh, three things that I'd put on the list. Limited direct experience. A lot of the areas I'm looking at are new fields that are bursting into prominence quite quickly. There isn't anyone with 10 years of experience because the field didn't exist 10 years ago. Uh, or there are people moving into the field with a rapidity that you need to be able to guess who's going to succeed in this new area because it just needs to be stocked with double or triple or quadruple the talent that it has today. Uh, second area, a career stumble or two along the way. I mean, we're going through an economic time that's creating jagged resumes by the millions. And when I get out and do some of the media appearance on this, I get a lot of calls from people who've done fascinating things and hit a wall somewhere in 2009, 2010. If we're looking for resume perfection, those people are unemployable for the rest of their lives. If we're looking for people who can take their setbacks, bounce back from them, and sometimes emerge as extremely motivated people. And there's nothing like having stumbled once for people say, you know what, I will never let that happen again. And if you look at the life stories of just about all high achieving entrepreneurs, they run into some walls. And that's part of what makes them so driven and so successful. And then the third area I've, um, I've chosen to word it, personalities that take a few moments to appreciate. But I think we, we like to meet polished people in interviews. We like to meet people with you know, uh, marvelous manners. But sometimes the most interesting candidates do not dazzle in the first five minutes. It takes a little while to realize that underneath that shyness or brittleness or inability to look people in the eye is someone who can accomplish a lot. And they're not being recruited, you know, particularly in technical fields. You're not looking for someone to be you know, head of sales. You're not looking for someone to be you know, the TV spokesperson. You're looking for someone who can do a job really well. And I think the best interviewers have an ability to relax uh, in all three of those directions to catch talents that stand out in other ways. So let me start to take it back more toward the, the world of um, business, technology, uh, research, innovation. And I, I deliberately gave you three examples from far away fields. And now let's start to converge on more familiar territory. 
So I'm going to start with Andy Grove's challenge. When I was getting started on this book, I ended up at a breakfast where Dr. Grove was there. And um, as any of you know, either directly or indirectly, Andy Grove is a man with many strong opinions and no hesitancy about sharing them. So I was about two sentences into explaining this book. And he said, well, what you need to do is go to Utah, and you need to figure out how they got good at computer graphics. Because we never were as good at graphics as we wanted to be. And there was something there, and go find out what it was. Uh, the picture, by the way, is the famous Utah teapot. This dates back from the mid-70s. One of the challenges within the department was how could you do computer rendering of an image that had not just light and shadow on a curved space, which gets subtle, but also has protrusions and holes and the like so that as you rotate it around, your view changes. And at one point, the spout will disappear and then come back. The handle will disappear and come back. And you know, this becomes much more simple than just modeling a pyramid. Uh, so they figured it out in 73 or 74 and you know, went on to, to build an enormous number of things far more complex than the teapot. So let me show you a couple of the people that came out of Utah. And bear in mind, this is a school that had a one-person computer science department in 1965. It was basically nowhere on the map relative to the you know, MITs, the Caltechs, the Stanfords, all the, the places that uh, the Illinois that we think of as computer science pioneers. But out of there, they had Jim Clark, you know, who brought us Netscape and Silicon Graphics. They had Ed Catmull, who brought us Pixar. Uh, Alan Kay, huge impact on the Macintosh. John Warnock, founder of Adobe. And there was a time in you know, the early to mid-'80s where you'd say almost anything interesting in computer graphics can be traced back to Utah. And when we say trace back to Utah, we really trace it back to David Evans, who was the now, founder and first employee of the computer science department. I spent a lot of time in chapter three talking through his life story. He's one of the forgotten heroes of the um, computer field in general, and computer graphics in particular. Uh, an army scout during World War II, I mean, someone who literally his job was to venture around enemy lines and into no man's land and see what he could learn. Um, a pioneering designer of computers for Bendix in the late 50s, very interested in usability. Everyone else was trying to speed up computational speed. His interest was how do we make this more engaging than a teletype terminal? How do we get something where people can actually see what they're doing? Um, good Mormon family, you know, traces back to Mormon bishops and high-level people. He ended up spending the first half of the 60s at Berkeley, partly because it was a good school and partly because there was a little bit of him was just curious. What do how did the heathens live? What are they all about? Um, so you know, he was a lifelong explorer himself. And what distinguished him, the reason that he's, he's getting a couple slides here, is this willingness to look for people who were trying to find the frontier. And in some cases, they didn't know what frontier they were looking for. And Catmull originally wanted to be a Disney caliber animator. And he's a very good drawer, but he felt he might not be able to make it all the way to being one of Disney's top guns. Uh, he ended up, you know, wanted to be a top physicist. Uh, that didn't quite pan out. Ended up going to work for Boeing. They had, you know, layoffs as the Vietnam era began to wind down. So his first three careers basically didn't work out. And by the time he got to Evans, he was looking for career number four. But he had that hunger to get somewhere exciting. And both Catmull and Clark, two very different people, had said, I started out in physics, but it was moving too slowly. I got a sense people weren't working on big enough problems. It would take me 10 years to get to the frontier. I wanted to get there faster. Um, and that's the kind of people Evans pulled in. Uh, he also ran a fascinating shop. Uh, he's a, a kind man. Uh, not a lot of criticism, a lot of encouragement of people. Uh, he did two things that were striking. One was to pose very simple but audacious questions to people. Basically, could you do X? And X was something that was seen as impossible. And they just sort of leave it for them. And he had ambitious enough people, they say, I'm going to go out and try that. So it was a place that was constantly trying to tackle big problems. The other thing he did is arrange the architecture of the office so that the, the center of the floor where they had all of the researchers, uh, there was an open photo lab with big glass windows where everyone's latest creation was taped up. And it was sort of a wall of pride. You walk by it, and if you've got something interesting, everyone else can see it. And there's that friendly competition, that desire to go, you know what? What Clark put up there is pretty good, but I got something better coming. And it, that you know, team pressure drove people to, toward excellence. Uh, it's a simple habit. It's one that I've found in, in many great organizations. It's one I find every time I visit Microsoft is the feeling of you're around great people, you're building things together, and you know, you, everyone pulls their weight and the desire to kind of keep moving the level of achievement up. 
And Evans had the tragic fate of ending up being very sick in the 1990s and not really able to help oral historians as they started coming around saying, how did you do it? So we're deprived of his voice for his habits. Fortunately, his second son, Peter, had worked with him closely and had a good sense of how his dad did it. <coughs> I don't put up a lot of text slides, but this is one that I really did want to just spend a little time on the words. It was an explanation from Peter Evans about his father. And you can probably read it, but just in case anyone's in the back. Um, my dad looked at people very differently. He hired a lot of people that happened to fail history or whatever else. Some of them you might even call scary. It didn't matter to him that they weren't polished in some areas that weren't important to their job performance. What he really cared about was what they liked to do. And that is really the jagged resume concept in you know, four sentences. It, looking for people who are passionate about what they do, good at it, and single-minded to the point of perhaps not being so polished in everything else. And those are the kinds of achievers he brought and achieved you know, worldwide fame for, for what Utah did as a result. So where do you find the jagged resume? Uh, this is a, a little statistical exercise that fascinated me. Uh, we all know that you know, there's a lot of talent concentrated in a handful of places. Uh, and if you're doing recruiting, there's a, you know, a top 10 or top 20 engineering schools that you'll go to where most of your you know, good PhDs or master's holders or what have you will come. It's a little hard to get comprehensive data, but there's a, a very nice, clean proxy, and that is where the Rhodes Scholar program goes to get its people. And they've been running the program since 2005. This is you know, where Senator Bill Bradley and Bill Clinton and lots of other American achievers came in, and they go spend their two years at Oxford, and it becomes a launching point for what often become very prominent careers, Supreme Court justices. There's no end of, of people who've, who've used the Rhodes Scholar program to go higher, and it's seen as a, a marker for some of America's most impressive young achievers. So you, you do the list, and you know, it, it goes back a century, so the Western schools are underrepresented here, but Harvard, Yale, Princeton are at the top of the list. The military academies do well, um, you know, Stanford, UW. Um, you, you'll find basically what's, what's pretty standard for the top 20, top 30 American schools. Slight quirks in ranking order, but uh, it's a list that's familiar. And then you go down to all the schools that have only had one Rhodes Scholar in their history. And it's a list of schools that hardly ever register on our conscience as extraordinary places for talent. But at one point, they had someone who fit that bill. And that's the Messiah Colleges, the Nebraska Wesleyans, the Central Arkansas, the Sioux Falls College. And you could say, well, those are such outliers that why bother paying any attention to them? Here's why. If you take all those one enrollee schools and roll them up together, you've got something that ends up number six on the list and ahead of all the places that you ordinarily would go for uh, top talent. And aggregate the long tail in any sample and you start to get something that's a pretty interesting list. You see it in business, you know, look at Amazon and they sell eight million books. Um, books number 100,000 to eight million, none of them sell very much. But it's that ability to have a list that's deeper than you know, anything that Barnes and Noble or Borders ever had in their store that's helped make them so successful in the book business. Uh, so there's a long tail of, of talent as well when you come to people. And oh, I was chatting with one of your recruiters um, earlier today, and she was making a point that, yes, Microsoft will hire you know, with great depth from the top schools. Uh, but you'll also every now and then find someone from central Willamette who you know, just happens to be unbelievably bright and may not have picked the conventional path but can contribute a lot here. And I'm always impressed at organizations that don't lop off the pool of talent too early and look wider. The question, of course, is if I'm telling you, you know, it helps to look even wider, how do you deal with that in a world where anyone who does recruiting, or for that matter, even anyone who's brought in as a technical interviewer, uh, feels we're seeing too many candidates as is. The, the field's cluttered. You know, my, the, the metaphor here, my desk is already stacked with piles and piles and piles of resumes. I'm looking for one person. How much needle in a haystack can I possibly put up with? So in the book, in chapter six, I tell the story of something Facebook did. It's probably something that any tech company does. And I just had the good fortune to find people who are willing to pull back the curtain a little more on the process. And that is to you know, open up on a puzzle program where you're looking particularly for coders. And you'll give them challenging, gnarly, long problems that you know, can take three hours, six hours, 40 hours to solve. There's no pay. There is an email address at the end that says, send in your solution. And when you do that, it's got two or three wonderful things going for it. Uh, the first is you're finding out who really wants to write code. 
as opposed to who just wants to have a well-paying job at a tech company with free sodas. And uh, they get 70,000 solutions a year. Second good thing is you can score them all automatically. You run them through and either the program works or it doesn't. The ones that don't work, uh, you've sloughed them off of the system without burning up recruiter time or interviewer time. Uh, your cost per candidate is probably a fraction of a penny. Uh, then you identify the ones that are most interesting, bring them in for interviews, uh, and, and pursue more deeply with the most interesting pool of that. So out of Facebook, 70,000 that have solved their puzzles, 118 have gotten jobs. Um, in some programs, that would be a miserably low yield. There's no way you could sustain it. The more that can be done automatically, and we're moving into an age where resumes are you know, being searched for keywords, where people's Twitter streams are being paired with their LinkedIn profiles to get a sense of not just what they say they've done, but what sort of running commentary they've provided on their actual work. Uh, you can look at you know, what people contribute to chat boards and get a sense of who's a thought leader and who's a sponge and who's a parasite. Uh, and, and we've got an ability now to handle those big stacks of resumes more effectively than we did before and to start to find interesting candidates uh, without burning up nearly the resources previously. So there's a middle section of the book that talks about talent that whispers, that looks at ways that you can you know, look at the long tail of talent without you know, burning up resources or energy or optimism. And uh, I would expect as you know, the hiring market gets to be more and more you know, widely posted, more digital. I mean, you know, I was hearing stories today if you've got 80 to 90 applicants per opening. And you know, that's uh, in areas where you don't even aggressively post. If you aggressively posted, you could get 500 or 1,000 for a position. So you know, we're in a stage where the question is, how do I sort through that many? And the Talent that Whispers section of the book talks a bit about how to do that. Uh, Big lessons, uh, looking for hidden virtues. I, mean, I, I think in many organizations, the interview process is broken. It's more an affirmation of what people have on their resume and a search for superficial affability. You know, do I like this person? Do I want to go out for a beer for, with them? Some of the best people in an organization are not necessarily your drinking buddies. But they just happen to contribute a lot to, to what's done. And you know, I have my checklist, but uh, I think the, the first step in any organization is to figure out what do we really want? What defines us? What are the traits we need? I mean, sometimes it can be very distinctive. Uh, linear technology, relatively small chip company, but incredibly profitable. All they do is analog. They do the little circuits, but they make chips for you know, three cents, eight cents, and they sell them for 50 cents. It's good business. But they need designers who are willing to fiddle and tinker with the, the circuitry that helps a um, a hybrid car battery run well that helps the flash in a cell phone flash. And they need people who are basically willing to make 40, 50 attempts at a circuit and come back and keep redrawing it and redesigning it every week or so until they've got it just right. Uh, and what they want is people who've been tinkering with electronics their whole life. So when I talk to engineers there, they're all the people who electrified garbage cans at age 10 to bother the neighborhood cat or who made you know, buzzers that would torment their sisters at you know, age 12. And it's a way of life. And those are the kind of people who are going to stay and build their kind of circuits. They probably wouldn't be very good Intel engineers. Uh, they might not be the right sort for NVIDIA, but they are the right sort for linear. And that ability to say, these are our people, this is our tribe, is crucial. Uh, next area, this is one that comes from um, Todd Carlisle at Google, who's staffing director. And Google, I often think of as one of the most credential-centric organizations. Uh, I think they finally stopped asking for SATs, which I always thought was just really strange. I mean, a, a lot of stuff has gone on in life beyond taking the SATs. And, uh, but anyway, they still look for top grades, top scores. But Todd's point is, read the resume upside down. Often the things at the end, the, oh, by the way, I'm a you know, life master bridge player at age 21. You go, wow, that's a lot of hard work to get there. You're clearly driven to be successful and focused and achieving in something. If we can bring you around to what we actually do, you might be a good hire. Um, community service and some other types of jobs, but that ability to go all the way down to the end of the resume and say, who are you? What are your passions? What are your energy? How pumped up can you get for something? Uh, that starts to surface a whole interesting set of candidates that otherwise we're trying to make fine-grained distinctions of, you know, is a 3.8 from uh, the U better than a 3.9 from Gonzaga? I, they're, we're all bright people. Uh, and the, the differentiator is going to have much more to do with behavior, with motivation, than it is with you know, fine distinctions on grade points. 
Uh, last area, and this is one that I've uh, been reflecting on for a long time. We, a lot of our culture orients around asking what can go wrong. We do stress tests, we do safety analyses, we do what if uh, analyses. We spend the final stages of interviewing job candidates looking at all the reasons to disqualify them, you know, their credit scores, their driving records. Uh, we run criminal histories, we run drug tests, on and on and on. There's validity to all of that. You don't want to hire people who've got some of those problems. But we've tended to try and select out with such intensity that we've lost the ability to select in. And, you know, jagged resume candidates, these are, the way to find them is to ask what can go right. What's the best thing this person presents? There's always time later down the road to look for reasons to, to disqualify. Uh, and the ability to take small chances on people, internship programs are spectacular for this. People come in for three months or in extended internships for a year. There's no guarantee to keep them any longer. It's a great way to try people where you're not sure if they're going to get it or not, but there's something in their uh, application and their potential that says this could be a star for us. And I've worked in some organizations with strong internship programs, and it's surprising how many of the people who get five, six, seven promotions came through the internship program. The people that you hire fully made get one or two promotions, and that's kind of where they lock in. Awful lot of the interns flush out, too, but the, the best ones end up more than justifying the, the time on the others. And now the final point, uh, if you believe in someone who knows that they're a jagged resume, who knows that they're a little bit of a chance, that's someone who's going to respond with remarkable loyalty and drive. And I think some of the you know, A-team hiring practices of, you know, find me all the A players, you end up getting people who, yes, they've got great skills, but if they don't buy into the organization, they're not going to be there long and they're not going to be effective contributors. So that ability to make the most of motivation and people's desire to succeed on uh, something that sometimes gets lost. So let me close with a, a little bit of humility. I could have shown this slide 20 earlier, and perhaps I should have, but uh, I do want to make sure I make these points. Uh, this book is a conversation starter. It's not meant to be the definitive answer. I've done a fair amount of hiring in my life, but there are people in this room who have done vastly more than I have. Uh, I interview for a living, but I interview primarily to gather information, uh, not to form yes and no judgments on people. I've done some of both, but I... I have a great deal of respect for people who live in this world, and I don't want to suggest that I have answers you've never heard before. Uh, what I do bring are stories from worlds that you might not be visiting. And I think uh, judging talent is an area where the wider we look, the more we see. Uh, and, you know, one of the book reviewers referred to this as the money ball of HR, which was a very nice thing to hear. And I hope some of the stories that you've heard have you know, not just been uh, entertaining for a moment, but of ones that have made you think about, you know what, they've got an idea there that... I actually want to chew on for a little bit. Uh, and so the other point is this is a long process. I mean, we've moved from a world where competency-based hiring was enough to fill most of the jobs to a world where jobs keep changing. They're subtler. Uh, the requirements are different. The human-to-human -human interactions become much more complex and more defining. I was just chatting over lunch with how you um, develop ideas that go back and forth between the research lab and the product teams. And you'd think that's a you know, technical technology transfer area. To some extent it is, but much more than that. Uh, I'm told it's an issue of people and it's an issue of trust. And the people who are going to be most effective at that are the ones who do have those kinds of intangible skills that I was running through on the list, that ability to connect with people. So we've got a lot of work to, to go to figure out how we redefine our evaluation metrics, our talent metrics, the way we search, the interview questions we ask or don't ask, uh, the settings we want to see people in. We may find we learn a lot more about people outside the conference room and the interview chamber and going for walks or going for meals with them than we do just kind of sticking in this very artificial formal process. But uh, I'd like to think this is a book that can help us get unstuck. If, if we've been, our feet have been pointing in the wrong direction, at least this is a book with some ideas and some suggestions of how to uh, get to a better place. Parting thought, uh, if you take away only one idea, make it, what are the jagged resumes in my world, and do I know how to spot the best ones? And what I've discovered, of course, is that a lot of times my audience is the jagged resumes. I mean, we all have had our ups and downs, and sometimes it's the downs that have given us the strength to go on and do new things. <coughs> so that's what I wanted to share with you today. I'd be happy to take questions on anything that uh, relates either to Microsoft World or to anything else in the talk, and if there's just some observations you want to share, that'd be great too. Thanks. Uh, what about persons who are in, say, uh, actors, 
I mean, they come in for a reading, you know, one opportunity. Of course, they have resumes that they show where they went to school and other things they try it out for. But how do you um, identify someone who has star quality and maybe longevity vis-a-vis -vis, um, either Broadway or what would be attractive to um, directors over the long time? So there's a, an interesting transition that's happened here. I would say 40 or 50 years ago, people were trying to make that once-in-a-career bet that you'd sign up Rita Hayworth at age 16 and you'd tell her, you're going to be a star and we're going to put you in a bunch of movies for the next 10 years. Now it's much more a project-by-project -project basis. You get people for that one particular role. So you know, there's no end of people who claim they discovered Tom Hanks. And discovering Tom Hanks actually consisted of having him carry sets around at some summer theater for a bit and getting one tiny bit part, and then Tom Hanks moved on. So in a way, because it's such a chancy, iffy process, by and large, we've let each person cast the right person at that moment and then see how they progress upward. But every now and then, there are latter defining moments. There's a great story about Julia Roberts, and I'll try and tell it quickly. But uh, she was a small fringe actress for a time, and Mystic Pizza ended up being her breakout role. She was the girl who was engaged and was going to get married, and it all fell apart. And uh, you know, eventually, she sorted out her life. But there was, you know, the classic sort of uh, aspiration and achievement and confusion and tears and you know, smiles. And it, it's a perfect Julia Roberts role. So she so shows up for the audition, and it's rainy, and she's lost the script, and she's not prepared. And you could be strict and say, you know what? you got to bring the script. you got to be prepared. That's an instant flunk out. But the casting agent who was evaluating her, there was a little bit of her that said, you know what, the role she's being cast for is the kind of girl who would forget to bring the script. She looks right. She's engaging. She's done well in her other things. And they said, come back tomorrow. Here's another copy of the script. You do need to bring it the next time. We can't make a habit of this. But I'm going to give you a second chance. And the second time, she did a you know, knock them dead reading and got that. So on... I think there's that, uh, to, to sum up, and sometimes there's no one eureka moment. People just gradually move up. But where there is, I think it requires an ability to stretch beyond the definition of the role and to see what else people can become. And I spent a bunch of time with casting directors, and they're very much in the world of potential and positives. And then they you know, rein themselves back in. But there's that early moment where you go, what can go right, and try and see the best of what that actor or actress could be. And then there's plenty of time to criticize afterward. But you know, open the horizons first. Yes? Um, I actually have two unrelated questions. Sure. So the first question is, how do you feel about this um, finding talent versus creating talent, as in the stuff that Malcolm Gladwell talks about in his book, Outliers? So in other words, like the effects? So the, I'm going to condense down the Gladwell thesis. But there's a great deal of what he says that you, know, you do your 10,000 hours of practice. Uh, you know, do your, your concentrated uh, you know, work that stretches you, and that is a hallmark to success. And I think we've got a causation correlation problem there. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's wonderful that the Beatles played for a couple of years in Hamburg at all hours of day and night and had to figure out how to do nine hours of music and just keep finding new songs. But you know what? There are a lot of other people who've played long hours in dinky bars, and they never sold. So uh, you know, yes, hard work will make anyone better. But I also think people's capacity for hard work is something that is not you know, instantly transferable. I and mean, I'm sure you've seen it in, in your area. There are some people who can still be doing good work at 7 and 8 in the evening and can do it pretty much you know, 6, 7 days a week. And there are other people that you know, they may still physically be in the office Friday afternoon, but they've checked out. And I think that's a differentiator that you know, in just about every field I talk to, that ability to gauge dedication, motivation. I mean, you, you can't remake people's personalities. Uh, so, um, yeah, and I think it's, there's a, a lot of good stories and good insights in Gladwell's work, but I would still contend that there's, the spotting role is crucial, that it's, it's not just a matter of we can all build ourselves into whatever we want. Okay, question two? Yeah, the second question is actually more a uh, personal question. Like, how did you come into this field? Like, where, where are you coming in from? I know it's been a long time, you've been in this field for a long time, I guess, but like, Sure. So um, whenever you ask almost any writer or journalist, we have fairly incoherent career paths. I mean, this is one of the few socially acceptable ways that you can have ADHD your whole life and still get paid for it and even rewarded for jumping around. So uh, I did an undergraduate degree in economics at Stanford. I loved writing. I was probably more involved in the college paper than anywhere else. Um, I 
saw writing about business as a way of kind of fusing the, the two great strands of what I was doing. Um, and then at the Wall Street Journal, moved from subject to subject. I'd um, you know, get knowledgeable about finance, did a book on that. Uh, graduated or transferred myself onto healthcare, did a book on that. You know, completed that. It was time to enroll in the next program, which was learning about high tech. Uh, and then, you know, as, as I moved from arid areas, going, you know, it would be nice if there were some commonalities here. I mean, I'm enjoying the sense of constant discovery, but is there anything that links them? And, of course, what links them is people. I, and these are all high-achieving, ambitious, um, sometimes perilous fields. I mean, the, there's no guaranteed path to success. And that's what drew me into this book. So um, I, I try and be open-minded, you know, reasonably bright, but the one thing I'll test off the charts on is curiosity. So, you know, I figured bring enough curiosity to the subject and we'll get somewhere good. Thank you. Sure. Yes. It's about the, the, your first anecdote. It's interesting. Daniel Kahneman, Kahneman was here about a month ago. Um, he uh, wrote an, an article in the New York Times about a similar test in the Israeli military uh, where he and his colleague um, conducted some research and they looked at the correlation between success in that test and actually the future success of the, uh, of the uh, people, and he found no correlation whatsoever. So my question is whether in, in, in your book there's some research, apart from being wowed by some of the anecdotes of uh, did the, were, uh, the, the things that you saw that are really proven to be effective in some scientific way. So I want to draw a distinction because the Kahneman anecdote is wonderful and he's got an Israeli military example where they've got people trying to move a log over a wall and they're trying to infer all sorts of things about leadership style by how you move the log. And the, the big message I'd share is it's possible to do an awful lot of cheesy simulations. And in fact the simulation field has been troubled by things that are artificial, brief, contrived and in the end you try and extrapolate out results that aren't there. What I liked about the example I showed is that it's much more sustained. I mean, this is not an effort to put people through an arduous 15-minute march and see what they do. This is an effort over the course of two weeks to run people through something pretty similar to the stress of being in a military engagement and having to, you know, form um, either retreats or attacks or what have you, day after day after day. And they're really only looking for one thing, which is how well do you hold up on tenacity. I mean, they're not looking for deep insights into who the leaders are, which is a much more subtle area. So I think the, you know, the U.S. Army 2009 is using a test that's both better built out and much uh, less ambitious than the Israeli Army, which was trying to, in the 1960s, come up with a one-hour test that would tell you everything about people. Uh, to answer your question about data, yes, I mean, the U.S. Army sits down and goes, okay, who did we take in? What did they look like at the time of review? Who are our successful soldiers? And you, you know, turning the clock backwards, you can go, the people we thought were good are good. Or, you know, the exact situation he pointed out, we're picking uh, the wrong people. And in fact, the U.S. Army did a lot of retooling because there was a time they were subjecting their soldiers to a great deal of screaming stress. And they could flunk people out that way pretty quickly. Uh, but they realized, you know what, that actually doesn't happen in battle. What's much more common is loneliness and isolation. Uh, and so they got rid of a marker that wasn't helping them find good soldiers and move to one that would. So uh, I like the underlying drive of your question, which is you know, validate whatever you think you're knowing by multiple years of, of looking at your, the people you choose. And the answer is, in this case, they did. But Kahneman's story is perfectly valid, and you know, it's a sign of how we've moved forward from overly simple, cheesy tests of the 1960s. Yes? Uh, with the jagged resume thing, um, what is the trade-off between that jagged, jaggedness and that core skills? You know, if you go back to the Green Beret example, you talk about how they're not having them shoot as part of these exercises. Presum presumably, you want them all to be able to shoot I mean, and be comfortable with firearms or, or you know, be comfortable carrying the weight of their equipment, things like that. Those are all basic qualifications for that job that, that, those, that those candidates have already shown they can do before they get to that stage. Um, so what is that trade-off between that, that jaggedness and looking for the, the interesting pieces of the resume against that, that core skill set, those, those core things? Or, or is the suggestion on the jagged resume thing to not pay as much attention to those, those kind of that baseline? 
So I'm, I'm very glad you brought the attention back to that because I mean, to answer first literally for the uh, special forces and then you know, by extension everyone else. In this case, all of their candidates have served in the U.S. Army for at least a year or two and most of them for five or six. Yep. So they've got some level of basic soldiering. Right. Uh, they've taken some sort of you know, rudimentary IQ test just to make sure that they are you know, not genuinely sure. dumb. I mean, <laughs> yeah. You can't uh, unteach dumb. Right. Uh, and they've passed a physical review that actually has been dialed down a little bit. I and mean, there was right. a time where they were looking for sort of push-up champions. Right. And you actually don't need that, and you need to be strong enough. But yep. uh, you know that's why the internal combustion engine was invented. We right. we don't have to do everything with, with brute force. Right. So uh, yes, you need some sort of gating to make sure that you're you're dealing with people who are at a basic level of competence. But uh, once you get to 50th percentile, 90th percentile, whatever your cutoff is, right. there comes a point where buying a little more on the sheer credentials and proven historical competence isn't buying you as much right. as looking for the motivational tools. <coughs> yes? I have an observation and a question. Sure. Of course. The observation is about, um, I read somewhere, I don't remember where, but it's about Holocaust victims, or survivors of the Holocaust, mm -hmm. and concentration camps, and what is the attribute that actually helped them survive the six years of being in the concentration camp? Uh, the answer was resiliency was actually the point, because he said the people who gave up are the people who were the optimists, basically. The optimist said, oh, this Christmas, I'm going to be back home. This Easter, I'm going to be back home. Mm -hmm. And when that was not happening, they just, most of them just gave up because their heart gave up. Mm -hmm. The resilient ones are the ones, the pessimists saying, I will survive this whole thing and stay out, and when the right break comes up, I'll go to it. I think that's a good thing. Now, the question I had for you was around the global nature of this. Mm -hmm. uh, the attributes that you talked about, you talk about global talent search. Mm -hmm. A company like Microsoft, are looking in multiple countries all over. Do these attributes apply as such? Is there a variance of this that you see when you look at global talent? So each country is its own story. Uh, I was in the UK and Ireland talking about the, the book a month or so ago. Uh, it connected very strongly with the UK audience, uh, particularly recruiters who felt that they were victims of a system that was way too credentials focused and that there were a lot of uh, very capable people who were not getting through the pipeline who should. I'm not sure it connected as much in Ireland. I mean, I, I'm going to get myself in trouble if I try and explain Irish social strata. But uh, you know, we found marketing the book. There's interest in Brazil, and you know, there's going to be a Brazilian edition coming out. There's some interest in China, but there was also reminders of Chinese talent evaluation systems are very different than what you do in the West. And I think the building up of you know national champion universities is early enough in its stage that. Uh, at this stage, you want to be proud and confident of the people who are coming out of some universities that are doing things that just weren't there 10 or 20 years ago. So I'd be hesitant to generalize about the whole world. I think there are other countries where this approach makes sense, and there are probably others where just talent pathways flow differently. So I, uh. yes? Um, a lot of what you were talking about, I might have been thinking about it in a different way. I'm a recent college graduate, one of the most what hit sort of close to home for me were all the times that I spent studying something that I completely found irrelevant to what I actually wanted to end up doing simply because I wanted to make sure that I was going to have that upper echelon resume. And I don't know if there's something that can be done systematically you know, throughout educational institutions that allows people to specialize and to become more focused at an earlier point in their careers as opposed to needing to think about such a broad aspect of different skills simply out of a, a worry that they're going to be restricted in terms of their opportunities if they don't divert their focus. I really like the question because I think you touch on two crucial public policy issues going forward. I mean, we're still living with an early 20th century model which says you go and get four years of college and then however many years of master's and PhD and at that stage you are a fully educated person. And my goodness, we live in a world now where you, you, the areas you need to know about are constantly changing. They, schools cannot anticipate them all. And would we serve ourselves better by having shorter stays in university at the early stages of our careers and then return, refresher, mid-career education? Uh, the other thing is the original college mission was to make you a well-rounded person. And you know, there were very explicit you know, Western civilization things and you know, great works of literature to read. And that was part of being seen as a cultured person. Uh, 
I always felt as an undergraduate I could read books on my own time. And to go and you know, spend a year out of the workforce essentially working through someone else's reading list, I, you know, there's, there's always time in the summer to do that. And so you, you don't want people who are so tightly trained in one field that they have no sense of being a citizen of the world, uh, you know, whether it comes to something as simple as voting intelligently or you know, having a, a feel for your dynamics of your business partners and other cultures. But uh, yeah, I, I like the direction you're headed, which is maybe we can condense the amount of time and let people pick up the skills they need to get started and then come back into the education system, uh, you know, either for brief sabbaticals or you know, mid-career retraining. And um, can I ask which school you went to? Well, I actually went to a technical school. I went to Rochester Institute of Technology. Oh, okay. And my, my main concern is probably not the same as someone who went to a liberal, liberal arts school, but um, it was more on the ability to start research early on and to perhaps have more time, even an undergraduate, devoted towards doing research and getting established in, in that aspect of your career, as opposed to necessarily spending time like say, for example, in a statistics class, you know, I, I could be spending that time in a completely separate aspect of mathematics. I don't have a very well-formed thought. It's more just that there are certain areas that they want you to develop in terms of maybe mathematics or your ability to think about things as a systems engineer, whatever they want you to do. But then they already have a, a defined curriculum that perhaps could be more malleable to the actual interests that you have towards the research goals that you want to pursue. I always like the people who figured out how to wiggle their way into the dean's office and say, I want to design my own major. And it takes a fair amount of nerve to tell them that at 19 or 20, you know more about what's relevant in education than they do. But the answer is you may actually know that. You may have a better sense. So you know, ideally, schools will let people write their own ticket to a greater degree. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, listening to what you're saying um, from a recruiting perspective, a lot of very individual things that you could do, look for the jagged resume and kind of, you know, think outside the box and influence groups to assess talent slightly differently. Do you have any opinions on what can kind of be done more on a corporate level to kind of influence that culture or open the gates to jagged resumes a little more? So I, is it too speak? So I did a talk for small company CEOs, and the stress points that came back from them were, I'm ready to take chances on interesting people, but my board wants me to do pure competence-based hiring and find people who've done the same basic job for 10 years, even if they're burnt out and aren't going to give me a whole lot because they look safe. Or even worse, my you know, junior managers aren't ready to get someone who ventures in a different area than I do. Uh, and, and you know, at, at Microsoft, you, you don't have the situation of the, the board second-guessing the CEO because of the classic venture tensions. Um, so you're... Like compliance and things like that that say they have to have these basic qualifications or you should things like that. Yeah, I mean, you usually need individual champions to change culture like that. And uh, I think the, the stories I've been hearing are, you know, the individual team leaders, you know, project directors, the like, who are willing to say, you know what, let's try something different. But it, it is pushing against the barrier. So um, I think it's one of the ways that big companies can kind of ossify their culture is they become much more concerned about hiring someone who's safe and fits all the checklists. And you know, if you look at why some of the, the largest companies have just slowed down as innovators, that, that can be a big part of it. But I, I think it's just kind of one individual rebel after another looking for the best they can do within the system. I, I wish I had some sort of automatic fix, but I, I think it's more kind of case by case. What companies in our space have you seen do that well? Look at the jagged resume and take those risks. Uh, um, Mozilla will do that sometimes. Um, Facebook is schizoid, and there are some examples that they do really well, and then there's some other times where they're as eager to keep getting people from the same schools with the same background. I think they, they are a bit more flexible on educational achievement just because so many of them, uh, the, the early generation kind of bailed on whatever they were doing in school. So that sense of if you can write code, that's as good as you know, having stayed in school for the very last program you could have had. Um, HP globally is doing interesting things. And I think probably in a way, the farther away you are from Palo Alto, the more interesting things you can try. 
And it's an interesting te tension of does being close to headquarters help you innovate, or does it tug you toward conformity? Like it, it varies a lot company by company. Uh, but I think the, the one great thing about high tech industry is at least people are asking that question. You know, in, in a way, one of the things I want to do with Jagged Resume is at least give people a term that would let them say, hey, what I'm trying to do here is under a framework that can sometimes work spectacularly. And you still need to fight all the battles of are we going to do it this particular time with this particular person. But I came into it and felt there wasn't even language to talk about that. That it was all sort of, you know, you, so hopefully I've contributed something that at least makes it easier to have that conversation. Well, I, Actually, ends up being our last question because we've snuck it in there. <laughs> <laughs> well done. I hope everyone is interested in getting your books signed. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Thanks so much.